Good afternoon. We'll get started. I'm Gary Sealing and I work at Element 84 as a software engineer. I have the pleasure of introducing for this afternoon's talk a longtime friend and ETE co-organizer, Martin Snyder, who is the VP of Engineering at a company in the clinical trial space called Pinnacle 21. Today, Martin is going to talk about the different meanings of the word free as it has been used in software. His talks are always interesting and deeply thought out, so I'm looking forward to seeing what he has for us today. As always, thanks everyone for joining us in the, for the online version of ETE. Um, and if anyone has questions, feel free to post them in Slack. Take it away. All right. Well, thank you everyone for, for coming to uh, hear me speak about all kinds of free. Again, I'm Martin Snyder, the VP of Engineering at Pinnacle 21. Pinnacle 21 enables life sciences companies to measure and improve the quality of their submission data. Um, we're going, to, uh, we're going to move pretty quickly through a bunch of things. We're just going to start over with some basic, uh, basic vocabulary for everyone. So um, the word free, I'm sure many people are familiar with. Uh, it has 43 different meanings, uh, according to dictionary.com. And, and I broke them down according to this pie chart, and they're all over the place. Um, there's two that I called out, numbers 5 and 11. Um, and they're, they're the two most common meanings. Um, you know, the first one is liberty or a lack of restriction. And the second one is, is something without cost. And of course, we'll be talking a lot about, about both of those things. Um, there's some other, other interesting uh, uses like uh, you know, a dye-free or, or allergen-free product is the, the absence. Um, you know, free electrons is the scientifically unrestricted. Uh, I'm free with my time, uh, generous. So there's, there's a lot of um, nuance to the word and, and, and a word with this many potential meanings and, and, and that much variety ends up being um, potentially difficult to use or difficult to uh, use with clarity. Um, so let's talk about a different word. We'll talk about just liberty. Um, and so liberty uh, you know, is in some cases a synonym for free. Uh, it only has eight meanings and there's much less variety, um, even, even where I've broken them out on the pie chart. Um, it, uh, it comes out to about the same thing, with the one exception of Lady Liberty, uh, which you know, refers to the, the Statue of Liberty. But in most other cases, it has to do with, with a lack of restriction or, or lack of, of constraint. And you know, we have a word like gratis, and gratis is uh, you know, a Latin root um, and, and has a two, two meanings, which, which basically reduce to the same thing. And the pie chart that I was generating doesn't put a label when that's the case, so we get a big blue, blue dot. Uh, but it basically, gratis just means there's there's no charge, um, and there's there's nothing um, nothing else to uh, that can be implied by that. Um, when you get to the misuses of free, um, many of those misuses are are intentional. Um, I feel um, so. For instance, uh, you check into a hotel; they have a free breakfast, uh, or a restaurant offers free refills. And of course, there's no part of it that's free. It's included. It's uh, included is um, you know something that, that cannot be separated from, from some other things. So, so a, a lot of times when people use free, especially in a product context or in a marketing context, um, it's, it's not a genuine offer. It is, uh, they, they actually mean included, which is a whole different, different word um, in, in my mind. Um, another, another thing that comes up a lot when people say free, but, but it's not even close to what they mean is barter. Um, so, so barter is, is a, a trade. Again, there's five meanings. They all reduce to the same thing. There's, there's very little Im ambiguity when it comes to barter. Um, and so a barter is a transaction, um, and it's a transaction that doesn't involve money or currency or something like that. So I might trade, for instance, a, uh, a signed sports jersey for someone's used iPhone. Um, or a company might offer you free training. And, and something like free training is, is a, a fair example of barter because both both parties to the transaction are getting something in return. The company that's offering the free training, um, they're getting, you know, mind share. They're getting a, uh, you know, a statistic. You know, they, uh, we have this many people trained on our technology. And you can see when people talk about things like Java, it's like, oh, Java has 6 million plus developers worldwide. You can see there is, there is a value in having people familiar with your technology. Um, and then on the individual basis, you know, accepting free training, you, you get something in return. I mean, you're, you're contributing to the, the company's statistics. Uh, but at the same time, you are, uh, you know, you're, you're increasing your own knowledge. You're gaining what could potentially be a, a market, a marketable skill. Um, now, now barter is interesting because, uh, you know, currency makes it easy to get the value right. Um, if, if I have, uh, for instance, a damaged iPhone six, I can go on eBay and I can pretty much figure out what that's worth. You know, eleven dollars and sixty-three cents or something plus shipping. I mean, there's always some some number that you can put it on, and it's really easy with currency to get the value exactly right. 
But when I'm trading, you know, one thing for another, it's harder. Like that sports jersey and the used iPhone, those two things may not have the exact same value. And usually in a barter scenario, people just kind of shrug their shoulders and they realize that someone might be a little bit ahead of the other and you try to get it right as best as you can. Um, but it turns out that, you know, in the context where you're using a word like free and what you really mean is barter, um, the person that's pushing that, usually they're the ones coming out ahead. So that's just something to uh, pay attention to in general. Um, in terms of free, one of uh, the next two are my favorites. Um, there, there's a term white elephant, uh, and I think many people are familiar with this, but, but for those that aren't, a white elephant is a gift that you really don't want to receive. Um, and uh, you know, a great example is an actual white elephant. Albino elephants um, are incredibly rare. And going back to like, you know, 16, 17, 1800s, they were not only rare, they were sacred. Um, and, and sacred meant that if you had one, you couldn't just, you know, put a harness on it and put it to work. Uh, you couldn't treat it poorly. I mean, you, you had to care for it to the best of your ability. And so owning a white elephant was a great um, indicator of wealth. Um, and to give somebody a white elephant is certainly a very generous gift because, you know, it is both rare and sacred. To receive a white elephant, not so great um, because now you're, you have this obligation of care. Um, and so a, a white elephant, uh, typically it's something that, uh, you know, may or may not have an emotional attachment, but it is something that is not altogether undesirable, but the maintenance costs potentially exceed the value. Um, and so, so that's something, uh, you know, that, that comes up a lot where, um, hey, I might offer to, uh, to give you a free horse and you would be wise to reject that offer because caring for a horse and, you know, stabling it and feeding it is, are, are, are very uh, expensive, expensive activities. And then an albatross is, is something that, that comes up from time to time uh, in the context of free. An albatross is a burden. And, and many times an albatross is an emotional burden, um, more so than a, uh, than a, um, a physical um, burden. Uh, and generally, an albatross is something that you would give away for free if you could, but no one's going to take it. And that's because the disposal cost of this undesirable item is greater than its value. Um, and the value maybe is therefore either zero or negative or something like that. But, um, you know, if you have, like, for instance, a file on your computer that has negative value, you just delete it and you're done. Um, but there's other things that you might have where it's, it's, it turns out to be cumbersome to, uh, to get rid of them. Um, and this leads us you know, to, to the punchline slide of the opening, where when people are talking about free, especially online, um, they'll, they'll say these things, free is in speech versus free is in beer. And of course, we're going to get to, to where that, that comes from. Um, and in each one of these cases, there, there's really a better indicator of, of what that is. And so free can be used in, in a wide variety of manners. And it's, it's oftentimes up to the reader to understand the nuance of what, is, uh, what is, is meant by that. So of course, free as in puppy and free as in mattress are, are my two favorites when you, uh, um, when you see that. All of these terms um, have been used, with the exception of refill, um, all of these terms have been used directly in reference to open source software one way or another, especially if you get out on social media. So this is, uh, um, this is just some examples. Of course, there's many other uses of free, but these are the ones I think that are most useful from a vocabulary perspective. Um, and so let's move right into talking about free and open source software. Um, and of course, a lot of times these two things are conflated and, and they are completely different. And free software uh, directly relates to liberty. And this, this is the description of free software taken from the Free Software Foundation uh, directly. And all of my slides, which I'll share later, um, all the links take you to the source materials for, uh, for, for all these quotes and, uh, and, and items. Um, this is a problem. I mean, I think this is a mistake because they, they used free in a nuanced way. And you can see, you can see just the, the mental gyrations they're going through uh, to, to explain what they really mean. Um, and I would suggest their energy might have been spent better choosing a better word that doesn't require this level of, of, of explanation to get to what you really want. Um, and, and when you do something like this, when you start to use words in ways um, that have some kind of nuance or some creativity to them, um, there's a lot of things that can happen that are mostly negative. One is it could be misunderstood by people. But the second is it really opens the door to bad faith actors. Um, bad actors can cause you lots of problems, um, but when you do something like this, you make it really easy for people to, um, to take advantage of your creativity and good nature and twist the meaning into something that is not what you would have wanted. Um, 
And this leads directly to the GPL because the GPL, when you think about it, the GPL is, is not a free license. It's not, hey, here's something you can use for free. The, the GPL it carries some burdens with it. And this is of course intentional. The whole point of the GPL is to declare that there is this thing called freedom for software, that, that people have certain rights with their software to self-modify and to, to not be beholden to the, the, the source organization of the, 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 the originator of the software, that they have the ability to make changes as they see fit and potentially share those changes downstream uh, with other people. And um, it really GPL is a barter arrangement is uh, it, it's saying um, we have all of these GPL software assets, which you can use with, you know, you can basically use with, without restriction, um, both in composing new solutions and, and for almost any other means. And all you have to do in return to get access to that world is you have to help create more software that has the same properties. You have to add to our pile of software assets to get access to the collection. It's a barter arrangement. Um, and, uh, and, and this, is, this is the purpose. So people talk about it as in, it being infectious and, and limiting rights and stuff. And really, it's, the GPL is a tool to further a political agenda. Um, and, and that was the intention. And if you read about it, you know, Stallman's works and, and a, a lot of other people, when, when they wrote about it back you know, in, in the, the early days, in the 70s, um, they were very clear about this. But not a lot of people read those things. Um, and, and there's like commercial examples where like a, a company, um, Loogy has a, a library called iText. Uh, it's a PDF library. It was a dominant force for, for quite some time. And then they, they kind of clued into this and they said, you know, we're not going to have a really permissive license anymore. We're going to switch to the GPL um, and we're going to have a dual license uh, so that, you know, the, the people that, that have money will give us money. And the people that don't have money can still use the software. They just have to also contribute to the GPL pile. Um, and it's exactly what the intention was. And of course, they were immediately undercut by, by libraries like PDF Box, which basically, oh, we're just going to you know, do exactly what you do, but we're also just going to have a more permissive license. And so that makes it hard to compete. And the intention of the GPL was to create this body that let, um, you know, basically made it an advantage to be open and free in that manner. Um, and, and so that the, the commercial vendors would have had to pay either more money or invest more time. And this would have put um, you know, the free software movement, which did not have a lot of money on equal footing with the commercial software movement, which you know, in most cases does have a lot of money. So um, that's kind of what was going on there. And, it, and it's, it, it's set up as barter, but it's not always you know, thought of, especially like in, in, you know, in, in 2020, it's not always thought of in, in the way that it was intended. And I think most people view the GPL today disfavorably. And so this gets to free versus open source. A lot of open source software have very permissive license where, where you don't really have to give anything up. It's not a barter arrangement. It's just um, this is available to you without cost. And there are certain terms and restrictions like, you know, you, you, we don't have a liability here or you can't make a patent claim against us and stuff like that. So it's not like, you know, it's completely public domain and without restriction. Um, but there's also, you don't have to give anything in return if you choose not to, if you're going to take, uh, you know, accept open source software. And of course, we're talking about super permissive licenses like uh, the BSD two and three clause or MIT, um, you know, and then you get to things that it starts to get, you know, more and more complicated, like the Mozilla, the Eclipse license, the Apache license and stuff like that. But they all have this, this general property in general is that they are open source licenses and talk about how you can share the source code. And most of them say you can do just about anything you want, including commercialize it and including um, make changes without, without sharing those with other people. And there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things that you can, that you can do with that. Things that are much harder to do with the, uh, with the GPL license. Um, and when, when you talk about, uh, you know, a, a lot of this movement, especially as you look at it over, say, the last 30 years, um, you can see a hand at work, right? A, a lot of the people that push the hardest for open source software are the ones that are consuming it, not the ones that are creating it. Back when the GPL was around and the Free Software Foundation was the, the only show, the, the, the creators of of that movement, they were the ones that were calling the shot. And now in many cases, it seems like the consumers are calling the shots. And, and, and part of that is abusing the word free and conflating that with open source and, and muddying the waters to the point where people aren't even sure what's going on anymore. And you say, hey, you know, the APL is really convenient to use and, and we're gonna use that. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the APL right, or any of the other licenses. I'm just trying to draw a really clear um, attention to the differences between them. So in terms of um, using something that is Apache licensed, yeah, it's pretty much free. 
um, and using something that's GPL licensed is, is more of a barter. Um, and, uh, and, and because of that, people have this sting and, and they usually you know, kind of go with the, the free side. And then from the, um, from the supply side, you know, many times when people are involved in open source projects, the number one thing they want is adoption. And of course, the easiest way to get adoption is to just, you know, have fewer and fewer restrictions. So more and more people will use your stuff. And that's absolutely true. But the original intent of the GPL was almost like a trade union where, hey, if everyone making free software did it on these terms, then we would actually have a lot of clout today. And, and you look politically and you look, you know, across the industry and stuff, and, and there's definitely been a backlash over the last, you know, six months, 24 months, somewhere in there of, you know, a lot of people scratching their heads of, you know, what are, what are we doing? Like, we're, there's a lot of, you know, labor going in um, for uh, the creation of open source software. And a lot of the people reaping the benefits are different than the ones that are, uh, that are controlling the thing. And I think so there's been a little more attention drawn to this, uh, drawn to this recently. There's a psychology here, um, and, and there's there's a couple couple elements of it. It's 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 just important, I think, um, especially when you're dealing with any of these scenarios. It's important to understand what is going on in your mind and in the minds of others and stuff, just so people can make more informed decisions. Um, so this is a great quote. I've I've uh, used it for years. I loved it. Um, there's there's a big history behind it. So this is a good link to click if you're uh, if you're curious. Um, if you are not paying for it, you're not the customer. You're the product being sold. Um, and it's absolutely true, and it applies so much to free um, apps on your phone and free services online. Um, we're going to talk a second about uh, uh, email. Um, of course, it's not free. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a form of barter. Um, and and when, once you say that, once you realize it's a form of barter, then you can more clearly discuss what you're giving away and what you're getting in return. Um, there's a lot of other examples of, of this. If you're not paying for it, you're not the customer, you're the product being sold. And the best one is gender-specific cover charges in bars, which is now illegal um, in, in most states in the United States, but not, not all of them. And so you get a thing like, you know, ladies uh, enter free and, and men pay a $10 cover charge. And, and like that's, it, it really puts a, 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 a pretty fine point on who's paying for what, um, which is, uh, I think, in that case, distasteful, but not necessarily more distasteful than most of the other examples uh, that we can, uh, we can come up with. Loss aversion is an important psychological concept here. Um, so if we imagine two scenarios where, let's just say, um, I owe you money. Um, and it's $50, and we're going to have a coin toss. And if you win the coin toss, I'll give you 100. And if I win the coin toss, I'll give you zero. So it's a fair game. Um, the odds are two to one. The payoff is two to one. Uh, the, you know, there's the, uh, most people can understand this. And generally speaking, um, a certain number of people would accept that bet. They'd accept the double or nothing on money they were owed. And now we change the situation. And um, you owe me $50. And now I offer the coin toss of, hey, how about this? How about we flip a coin? And if I win, you give me 100. And if, if you win, you get zero. And of course, mathematically, these two situations are exactly the same. But if you do an extensive study, what you'll learn is that most people, when they stand to gain, when it's money they're owed, um, and so it's like it's not coming out of their pocket, they're more likely to accept the coin toss than if, if they're the payer. If they have the $50 in their hand and the coin toss is to, to lose an additional $50 out of their wallet, um, they're less likely to do that. And it's a, noticeable, it's a noticeable effect. And so people have a notion in their heads of, you know, a gain versus a loss for any, any circumstance. And that actually changes their judgment. So the same, normally like from a logical perspective, the same judgment would apply to these two circumstances. Um, but here, the, the subtlety of gain versus loss is enough to override judgment for, for certain people. Um, and th there's, other, there's other ways to study that. It's, a, it's an interesting experiment, but I think it's, it's generally an agreed upon effect. Um, and this brings us to paid versus free email. So of course, um, you know, when you use a free email service, we've discussed this, it's a barter situation. You're getting a variety of, of good stuff um, in, you know, in, in return. You're getting uh, you know, fast search and access and potentially unlimited storage. There's all these great benefits that you get and you're giving something up. And of course you're giving up your, your access to personal data. You're giving up like lots of, of, of uh, privacy type things. Um, you are, you're turning yourself into some sort of ad-based revenue stream in, in ways that are hard to see. Um, and I talked before about how in a barter situation, it's really hard to um, get the, the, the value exactly right. But I, I think it's, it's pretty easy to see that you're giving up more than you're getting in return in terms of monetary value. Because if that wasn't the case, every single company wouldn't be doing it. Um, and it, it doesn't matter whether it's 10 cents a person or $100 a person 
um, you're giving away more, more than you're, you're getting back. And so what we can see what it costs to provide similar services. So fast mail and proton mail are the two um, most popular personal email services. Like all three of these have corporate services that are priced, priced differently, but I'm just thinking of a personal account, you know, one user, no collaboration suite or anything like that. Um, and fast mail generally um, I think has one of the most favorable uh, kind of user experience, uh, functional feature sets, proton mail, generally is viewed as the most secure solution. Um, you know, so, but they're priced similarly and, and, and they both have you know, a lot to offer people. And many people stick with Gmail and they say, um, hey, you know, it's fine. I'm in Gmail, there's a cost of switching. I don't want to endure that. And 50 bucks a year, I'd rather not pay 50 bucks a year or something like that. If we switch it though, we can take a look at loss aversion. If I was paying $50 a year for fast mail and there was no free offering, and this is just what everyone did. Everyone paid $50 a year for, for email and it's just like it was in the late 90s. Um, and a marketer came along and said, hey, I got a great idea. I'm gonna give you $50 for unlimited access to all the data you have in your email system forever, right? I'm just gonna mine the, the shit out of it. And, and we're gonna we're gonna go to town on everything that you've ever communicated with anyone. You would no way, no way would I do that for I mean, what if they said a hundred dollars? What about four hundred dollars? Like when, once you start turning it around like that, people suddenly have a much higher value on 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 some of these things. And and I think it really does crystallize, you know, a lot of these issues for uh for people. Um that of what they're giving away by using some of these free services. And just by, you know, it's, it, it, the, the, the nature of barter makes it very easy to, to hide a lot of this from people. Um, and, and I think that there is something there that's worth, worth looking for. And now, should you pay $50 a year for another email service? I don't know. And, and part of why I don't know is that different people are going to value this stuff differently. Um, you know, it, it, and, and, and which email provider you use, they, they access your data in different ways. Um, and so you might be giving more away to one free provider than another. And it's really hard to, uh, to, to firmly establish all of that. Um, but I think when you look at, the, um, at, at the, the move from free to paid versus the move from paid to free, you can really see that, that something in your brain feels wrong. Something in your brain realizes that these two things are not evenly, they're not like measured by a number of $50. There's something more going on there that's, that's, worth, uh, that's worth thinking about. And of course, the word free is almost designed for abuse and it is frequently abused. And I think it's worth talking about a few of those circumstances. Some of them are entertaining, uh, some of the less entertaining. I think a lot of it depends on which, which side of it you're on. And so, um, you know, anytime you use an electronic banking service and you try to connect it to uh, an existing account of yours, you go through this ACH handshake process. And this has been, I, I can't remember, 1996, 97, uh, PayPal, X.com. There was a few companies that did this first and now almost everyone uh, does it. And it's an automated system where you link the two accounts and they make these two micro payments and then you put you stitch the two together and you get a four digit code and you can enter that code into the website and that kind of shows that you own the second account that you're trying to link to the uh the first account the first account i think probably everyone in the audience has uh, has done this at least once um and and a lot of times now they'll claw the money back and you might be like well why would they bother and of course this is this is why they bother is that there was a guy, and it wasn't just one guy. This, this is just the one, the one, the, the version of the story that I found first when I was Googling. Um, and so what he did was he made an automated script that would just create as many accounts as he could. And in this case, it was uh, it was a many, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of thousands of accounts. Um, and and he made the fake names and fake social security numbers to try to make you know make it look like they weren't all the same person. He shifted IP addresses, and his whole purpose was to just capture as many of those micro payments as he could. And he captured. Um, you know, fifty thousand dollars worth from two two vendors before uh, before he got caught. Um, now he went to jail, and I believe he had to give at least some of the money back. Uh, but most of the legal um, issues involved didn't have anything to do with him taking the money. They had to do with fraud in terms of him opening accounts for not real people, inviting, violating a lot of banking laws and things like that. So he would open an account with like you know Mickey Mouse or. Uh, you know, X-Men or, or Marvel, Marvel superheroes or something, just all kinds of, uh, all kinds of different things, um, you know, and made up social security numbers. And so that was what his crime ended up being more so than, um, than collecting the money. And you look at it from the, uh, 
from the bank's account. And, and you know, they have customer acquisition costs as it is, and, and they far exceed these two ACH payments. And so the banks originally were like, well, hey, it's, just let this go. If, if we end up, you know, losing an average of 73 cents for every time we link an account, it's actually cheaper than some of the other things that we might, uh, that we might deal with. Um, and, and uh, you know, and so, so a lot of people were thinking about different elements here as not having costs when they did have costs and they were doing things um, you know, in some sort of good nature and then they were, were being abused. And so there, there's, there's plenty of examples like this, but I think it's an interesting one that doesn't really have a ton to do with, with software in particular. Um, and then we get some that do have to do with software in particular. So this is just one example of a, a, an open source developer who um, you know, is basically talking about the maintenance obligations of a long running open source project, uh, which is, uh, you know, is, is tough. Uh, it's a tough situation to be in. And this, this really shows the difference between like a white elephant and an albatross. This is an albatross. This is, there's an emotional attachment here to this project. Um, but the, whatever value the project has is a maintainer is likely offset by the costs associated with this maintenance. And if you were to stop doing the maintenance, there's an emotional cost in, in kind of, you know, tearing down something that you've worked very hard to build. Um, and then there's also, if, if there was value in the, the software asset, the open source project, like there's, there's value in there, um, you're going you're gonna to hurt that value in, in doing this. And so um, a lot of the value in these cases, a lot of the value has already been given away for free, the access to the software, the years of development, the, the testing and maintenance and stuff like that. And then you're left with these things, which are mostly, uh, mostly costs. Um, so this is this is less of an abuse and just more of a controversy. I think you, you, we, uh, we've all seen it happen to people close to us, or we've seen it happen to projects which we value, where eventually someone either throws in the towel or they have to go on some extended hiatus, and it's just they're, you know, they 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 did everything with with good intentions, and they just kind of had the life sucked out of them by the consumer side of the open source world. Um, which can be a, a greedy and unforgiving uh, and an and unthankful uh, audience. So, um, you know, that's definitely a, uh, a, a, an issue in, in this area of free, especially as it relates to, uh, to free software. Um, here's another example, and, and this, this, is a, this is a really fun one to read about. I think many people probably heard at least the headlines, uh, but basically Chef employed someone, um, they, package some of their work as a uh, open source project um, and chef used that open source project. And so there's a, um, you know, there's a, a, a repository and then there's a deployment to a, um, to like a, 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 a central, there's a code repository and then there's a deployment repository. And both of these things are owned by the open source project. And then there was a dispute. Um, there was a dispute and a parting of ways. And one of the reactions of the developer was to simply um, just remove the code repository and to retract the uh, deployed artifacts from the, the binary repository. Uh, and this is interesting. And, and there's a lot of like different wrinkles to it. And, you know, I'm not trying to take, you know, sides here in this particular, uh, particular conflict, but one of the claims of um, the company was that this work should not have been packaged this way. It should not have been packaged as a separate open source project. It was, it was work for hire. It should have been in the, the corporate you know, repository in the first place. Um, and I think that, that complicated the situation. Um, and, and certainly if you, you uh, deliver some open source software, people are entitled to fork it um, and they're entitled to do almost anything with the source code depending on the terms of the license. But you don't have a long-term obligation to maintain that or provide it. If someone says, hey, I want this old version of the software, you say, go find it. You don't have to do that work for them. You don't have an obligation to, uh, um, to do a lot of this. So if somebody wants to, to tear this thing down and it happens that no one has forked it ever, well, that might be the end of it. And it turned out in this case, that, of course, it had been forked. Um, the thing with retracting binary artifacts, that's, that's obviously trickier because uh, you know, it, it's not the, the publishing of the binary artifacts isn't really part of an open source license in the first place. It's, it's something else. And, um, you know, what your rights and obligations there are to your audience from a moral perspective are very different than what your rights and obligations may be from a legal perspective. But most people aren't thinking about this. They aren't thinking about uh, the, um, the, the, the combination of things that goes into an open source project. And so like those, those keys to the kingdom, owning the 
the programmatic ID of the, whatever the registry token is for the, the central repository, that ends up being a big part of the open source project. Um, and it's not covered by the license, license and it's not subject to forking or something like that. So that's, um, that's, a, uh, that's a mess. And so this, this, uh, you know, th this whole situation is a mess. I think it represents um, you know, any dispute, you're gonna have um, a lot of uh, finger pointing, but I think there's some abuse in there uh, and that, you can, uh, that you can take a look at. And, and a lot of times when you end a situation like that, what it does is it makes you revisit what the original agreements were, um, to scrutinize them, to see if, if you know, these things actually are allowed under the agreement. And if you wanted to prevent them in the future, what might you do to adjust the agreements to, uh, to, to make that harder to do or less right to do or something like that. And then here's another, Another good one, and again, all these all these links, I, I would check them out if you're interested in the topic. So here, um, you know, Amazon is is pretty well known for consuming far more open source than they produce, um, and in this case, the uh, you know the open source project had a commercial offering, a software as a service version of their open source project, and um, Amazon directly competed with them. And uh, that's kind of a bummer. Um, it's Amazon's a tough, a tough uh, company to compete with, um, especially for, um, you know, they have like this big portfolio of services and they have, you know, all kinds of complicated billing and security and stuff. They have this huge infrastructure that they can, you know, um, kind of make your service part of. Um, and that's a tremendous value to the, the customer. Generally speaking, it's, 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 not, it's as a, as a, someone who was in the market for these services, it'd be very tempting to use Amazon's offering, even if there was a first party offering from the, uh, the open source maintainers. Um, and it's not really clear that they violated any of the licenses. And, and to that, I would say, well, maybe, maybe if, if you're really concerned about this, you should use a different license. And in particular, you know, there's the GPL three has some clauses that, um, that directly, um, uh, refer to this and the Afero clause in particular directly refers to this or something. So um, it could just be, uh, you know, it's a bad situation. You gave too much away for free and now you're paying for the price. It could be something worse than that. In this case, a lot of the, um, the, the legal arguments had to do with use of trademarks and not the open source license itself. Um, and I think that's indicative of that this, this from an open source perspective, this may not have been an abuse, um, you know, but from a, uh, from a, a good faith, you know, well participating member of the community, it, it, it may have been, um, you know, and, and, and what are you gonna do? And, and that, that kind of brings me to this point about the complexity of free and open source projects these days, is that the license that you choose almost always refers to just the source code or the source code plus some really limited things. Like even when the, the license is talking about patents, which is, is not, that common in, in many of the agreements. Um, it's, it's, you know, giving limited uh, licenses to patents and stuff. It's not necessarily uh, governing the patents themselves. It's only governing certain uh, uses in the context of the source code. Um, but the trademark is, is valuable and you own that trademark. And that's not, a trademark's not something that you can share or fork. If you don't enforce your trademark rights, you lose them, at least in the United States. Um, and so that's not really subject to any of this license. And of course, if you have like a Twitter account with a bunch of followers or whatever, or Instagram or, um, you know, whatever, whatever the, 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 the hub of your community is, um, that's something that you own that, you know, you have that, that login access and, and whatever those followers are and everything, that's something that you as the project maintainer or maintainers, um, that you, you own and have, and that can't be separated from some of the other things in the same way with mailing lists, um, domain registrations, like none of these things are really covered by open source projects. And you can see, like, for instance, when, uh, so Sun bought Star Office and they rebranded it as Open Office and they released it under the GPL and, you know, and a lot of people use that for some time. And then Oracle bought Sun and the people that were the maintainers, they basically took all their work and they forked it to a new project. And they then, and that's what LibreOffice is. It's basically the exact same software with the exact same people, but they had to leave behind all the stuff that's on this list. Um, you know, they, they basically, they lost the name, they lost the mailing list, they lost the website, blah, blah, blah. But they were able to, to kind of carry forward a fork of the software asset and they were able to continue their, their work and, you know, at the risk of fragmenting things and stuff. And so I think, you know, there, there's, there's plenty of other examples. I mean, you don't like to see the big fragments like that, but there's, there's always, you know, those public disputes. You can see these, where these separations become clearer to people. Um, and then that last item, um, a lot of this has to do with gaming for the, for the last item with the data that's not subject to license. But I know like when Doom source code came, was made available, that was a great moment for a lot of uh, game fans. Um, and and you, could, you could 
you could get the source, you could compile it, you could download it, but it wouldn't help you play Doom. You actually had to own Doom and copy the WAD files in and do some do some stuff with, it, with, with, with that to kind of stitch it together to make it work. So even in the case where like a game is released open source, um, you know, a lot of times it applies only to the, the software asset. So we spend all this time talking about licensing and free software versus open source software and all these different license levels and stuff. Um, and from certain perspectives, that's all you really care about. And mainly uh, it's the consumer perspective. But from the producer uh, perspective, there's a lot more sophistication to what's going on behind the scenes of, of, of building um, a, an asset here. A, a, an open, and then a lot of people, they do that. Um, they're, they're involved in open source, at least for part, for, for some sort of adoption and for some sort of, of celebration of, of the accomplishments and the, and the service and value that they, they provide to people. Uh, so now I'd like to shift gears and I'd like to talk about some free things that are worthy of mention. And of course, the first is a game that I wrote about a year ago called Hung Jury. Uh, check it out. It's free to play and I ask nothing in return. There's no ads. There's no nothing. Um, it's just it's a fun game. And if you're familiar with tabletop board games like The Resistance um, and you're familiar with uh, online party games like Jackbox, then you're going to love Hung Jury because it's Resistance plus uh, Jackbox. Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Uh, what we're going to talk about, though, is, is a lot of the free um, tools and libraries and products that I used in putting Hung Jury together. Because I pay $35 a year, I think, for a .io domain for Hung Jury. Um, and that's the only money that I spent on the whole thing. Uh, the rest of it was, and I actually, technically, I didn't have to. Technically, I could have pulled the thing off without even buying the domain. But I, uh, you know, I, thought, I, I thought I'd go big with the domain. Everything else was done um, you know, for free. Uh, it, with no outlay of, um, of, of, of any personal cost in any way. And that includes not just the construction of it, but also the, um, but also the, the, the operating of it. There's, there's no annual cost for me um, associated with it. So it's a, it was a fun project from that, that perspective. It was a fun, fun thing to, uh, to play with. So, so it was mostly developed on Ubuntu Linux. I mean, I had to, to pay for the, the hardware that I ran it on. I did some of it with uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux, which I recommend for people that haven't used it. Uh, did, you know, basically the front end was TypeScript, the back end was Scala. So I'm using, um, you know, the associated build tools. And then in terms of the software I was using, I used Intelli IntelliJ IDEA for um, the, uh, for the Scala coding and I use Visual Studio Code for, for TypeScript. And both of those are, um, you know, fully featured for those purposes and, uh, and with no cost associated with them, including like up, updates and stuff. And they don't really nag you for anything. There is no paid version of Visual Studio Code. Um, there is a paid version of, of IDEA, um, but it turns out for Scala, it doesn't really do much more than the community. So there's no, there's no need to upgrade for the narrow case that I was using. And you know, I built the thing. It's about 7,000 lines of purely functional code. There's not a single data mutation. That's another reason I built it. It was really fun to do. Um, and that was really only possible because of some of the, the libraries that, that I've listed here. And in particular, HTTP for S and FS2, which are part of the, the type level stack and they, they depend on cats. Um, it's really, really great for doing pure functional programming. And RxJS uh, is pretty well documented. I mean, it kind of the, it's the brainchild of Microsoft and Netflix, I think, primarily. Um, and then Create React App, it makes, makes React the development so much less painful in terms of hiding Webpack from people. So I wanted to give that a shout out. Um, and then the, the, in terms of the runtime, Heroku has a great free tier. Um, it, basically, the server could run perpetually through the year with no cost. It turns out to not work that way because once it goes idle, it'll shut down. And, and for what Hung Jury does, that's fine. I, I, I actually, that, that, that restriction that they put on the free tier, free tier is, uh, is perfectly fine with me and, and, and probably better. Um, and I use GitHub Pages to serve up the websites. And that's a you know, super high performing CDN that, that has no cost associated with it. Um, Google Sheets, I use a personal Google Sheet to just track every game that's played and who won. So I can do things, answer questions like what's the average game size or hey, are the, is the majority team winning or the minority team winning um, you know, in greater proportions? Is there some, some uh, tuning that I might need to do to the rules? And then Google also provides this Google Apps script where you can write a script and bind it to a web service and it can interact with your Google Sheet. And so that's, that's basically um, how when, it, when a game is finally over, the server just puts a payload together and bounces it off that, uh, that service and, uh, and all the right things happen. Um, so everything on here, I, uh, I really like. I recommend everyone, if you're not familiar with them, check it out. Um, and, and for me, it's part of giving back. Like I was the consumer of a great many things here. Um, in some cases, like especially like with HTTP for us, asking a lot of questions of the maintainers. Um, and, and giving back advocacy is one way that you can repay some people's uh, generosity. 
So uh, there's other things that are worthy of mention, I think, and in particular, the ones that I've listed, these are all um, you know, paid premium services. Uh, they're, they're used in a lot of um, you know, big, big time um, you know, commercial development projects. If you're developing a free or open source project, they all will grant you access to paid tiers at no cost. Um, and so that's their way of giving back to some of the, uh, the generosity of some of the open source community. So if you, if you have an open source project and you use some of these things, or you'd like to even just experiment with them, um, you, can, uh, you can definitely, uh, you can follow these links, uh, you, can, um, you can Google for it and you'll find your way. Um, a lot of them require you have to like sign up and, and get approved. For, uh, for their use in something. And there's more than just the five I've listed. Um, but for people that aren't familiar, you know, Travis is a great uh, continuous integration tool. Datadog, Datadog is a great log analytics tool. SNCC is a security um, assessment and repair for JavaScript. Jira is a defect tracking and ticketing. And Cloudflare is a dynamic uh, a kind of a defense against uh, security, online security threats for your servers and also a, um, a caching proxy. Um, so, so these are all great. I've used, um, I've used actually all of them in the past. Uh, just I didn't use any of them for, uh, for, for hung jury. But I think they're worthy of mention, and especially the fact that they are being trying to be generous in some some sense with the the open source community and give something in return rather than only uh, only consuming. And then uh, in doing my research, I came across this open source candies repository on GitHub, and it lists a ton of of things that have no cost. And almost everything on my list were on there, as well as some others. Um, and so if you're interested in this and just kind of seeing um, how people are talking about it, then that's a, uh, that's a good thing to, to check out. And from what I understand, like the open source Kansas repository uh, came out of a conversation on, on Hacker News. So it's, uh, there's, there's more source behind it than just one, one, person's, uh, one person's efforts. Um, so I have some final words for everyone. Uh, based on all of this, not just the word free, but the totality of everything that I'm, I'm talking about. The, the thing I, I wanted to say about free and open source software is that I, I'm not sure that everyone is clear that open source is a development model. A lot of people are, but not everyone. Um, and, and you see a lot of times people, especially on the consumer side, say, hey, what you've done is great. Can you release that open source? And I would contend that you should never do that. Um, there's no sense in releasing anything open source because you're not going to get anything in return and you're giving with uh, you're, you're giving too generously and and it's it, it starts to uh, you, you have to answer the question of why are you doing that um, if you're if you're soliciting collaborators then I think yeah making it open source is absolutely great and you'll see that the most successful open source projects usually have large numbers of collaborators and some of them come and go and some of them are dedicated over long periods of time and some of them actually get paid by companies to you know collaborate and contribute to specific open source projects so I think um, that's just something for everyone to have clear in their mind is that uh, there's no such thing as an open source release not in a sensible way um, open source is is for development and, and you should think of it that way um, and then just be really careful. Don't overcommit. Don't give away more than you um, than you want. If Amazon, you know, takes your stuff and runs a competing service, well, from the beginning, if if you don't want that to happen, then you should you should find a way to make that you know against the rules. Um, you, you don't have to give everything away. You can give away only the parts that you that you would choose to. Um, that's that's within everyone's everyone's rights as a creator. So don't get bullied into um, giving away more than you want. But of course, the flip side is if you want greater adoption, yeah. Yeah, give it a give it away, um, you know, and 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 start hyping it and advocate for it and everything. Um, that's okay too. Like I'm not trying to tell anyone what to do. I'm just trying to bring clarity to some of these decisions um, to to help people out with with that. Um, and then my final thoughts here, just in general, is if you ever get the choice between clarity and cleverness, choose clarity every time. I think the Free Software Foundation was hurt by their gameplay on the the word free. I think that that ultimately um, made their movement less successful than it would have otherwise been. And I think in particular, uh, you know, people acting in bad faith will absolutely abuse your cleverness and you will lose control of your message and, and you should you should avoid that. Um, so and this is not about the word free anymore. This is just in life and living in today's world. So clarity over cleverness. 
Um, if people are generous with you, you should always repay generosity with generosity, one way or another. Find a way to contribute something back to the things that you value. Because if you don't support the things that you value, eventually there's a good chance that you'll lose them. Even if you do support them, there's a chance you'll lose them because some of these things that are based on generosity are potentially hard to sustain um, uh, long term. And so I think that you know adoption and advocacy are two big ways that you can you know repay the open source movement. Um, you know, it, a certain licenses don't require disclosure. That doesn't mean you can't disclose. You should always disclose your usage of, of open source libraries. And, and that's part of how you can support the efforts of, of those developers. And if you get the chance to say good things about an open source project that you value, um, you should do so. You should make that slide and you should include it, even if it's not related to your talk. Um, just to say, hey, uh, you know, my work, my research is, is possible because of the generosity of some of these people. I wouldn't be here without them. Um, you know, I, I think if you're going to use the word free, don't let other people change its meaning for you. Free generally only means one thing at a time. Out of those 43 definitions, is, you're picking one. Um, and you, you don't let other people pick a different one and, and then bully you about that. And then finally, if you see people using bad faith uh, of, of, of uses of, of free, I think you should, uh, you should call them out. Um, you know, if someone, you know, offers me, uh, you know, they say, oh, free HBO or something. I, no, it's included. It's not free. Um, you know, and... It's, uh, I, I guess eventually it's a little pedantic and, and, and you might be a jerk sometimes, but you can sniff out when, um, you know, when people are, I think, uh, acting in a way that is, is not, not becoming of a, uh, a well-behaved culture. So that is everything that uh, I prepared, I believe. Uh, the slides are available right now. If you go to my website, uh, the link is in the bottom left, martinsnyder.net, the presentation link. Uh, right here, I'll take you to my list of presentations and all kinds of free, these slides are already posted. So uh, if you'd like to uh, grab those slides, um, feel free. And thank you everyone for your time and attention. And I have time for questions now. All right, thanks Martin. I'm gonna ask if they could have your laptop. Yeah, well, so originally what the plan was, if, if we weren't online for this year's Philly ETE, was I was actually, um, I had some, some final examples of the word free and, and I was gonna fold the laptop up and hand it to someone in the audience um, and give them a free laptop. Uh, and I given some consideration to um, calling them up on stage or for instance, tweeting a picture of me handing them the laptop and, you know, and, and doing that. And the question is, if I were to do those things, would it still be free or would it be barter? Because I'm getting something in return then I'm marketing the fact that I'm giving this thing away for free and drawing attention to it. And this person potentially has their privacy violated in return for a free laptop. Um, I thought it was, it was going to be an interesting discussion. And, and one of the questions I had was how, um, how I would continue to project my slides <laughs> after I did that. So at what point in the presentation do you give away the laptop? So it, I thought it would have been a really cool thing to do. Um, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to do it. You know, I, and, and when, I, when I conceived the, uh, the talk, I conceived this talk actually years ago. Oh, this is just, you know, we finally, finally put it together um, just recently. Uh, it was always something that I really wanted to do. So, uh, you know, I, I, I feel terribly, I thought that would have been great. And then the, the selection process was something that I discussed. Um, at the beginning of the talk, I was gonna ask the first three rows to try to identify who the youngest person was. And my presumption is of course, um, you know, the youngest person in, in, at the front, they're, they're engaged, they're paying attention, and they're probably the, the person that could most take advantage of a free laptop. Uh, it was not going to be the MacBook Pro that I'm using, I'll, I'll tell you that. It, but it wouldn't have been terrible, but it probably would have been like a, a $400 laptop or something like that. So um, yes, uh, sorry, no free laptop for anyone in the audience today. All right. Looks like there's uh, lots of uh, applause uh, emojis here in Slack, but uh, doesn't look like there's any further questions. Uh, if All anyone right. is interested, I would, I'm sure Martin will be around. You can interact with him. Definitely. Your questions later. So thanks for that. Thank you, everyone.